Well, hello again. I'm going to try to accelerate this a little bit, um, but if you need to stop me for questions, please do. Um, so, I, just uh, again, I consult with Medtronic. I also am a faculty in this class called New Product Design and Business Development at the University of Minnesota, which is an interesting class where we um, actually have half MBA students and half engineering students form student teams, work with a faculty advisor, and then they're supported by companies. And what's interesting about this course is all the uh, IP is owned by the company. Uh, so the goal here is really to have you a broad definition of, of medical devices, define that for you, look at the typical steps in the, in the medical device process, we've already gone through that, but then you need to know terms of GMP and GLP, and this should be on the tip of your tongue if you're going to be an entrepreneur or a, a product developer, and then discuss just some of the steps in clinical research. So my lab at the University of Minnesota is, sits in a historic place. It's the lab in the Mayo building where um, Earl Bakken uh, worked with uh, C. Walt Little High and used the first battery-powered pacemaker on an animal study. And um, the story behind this is kind of interesting. They developed this uh, device. This was in 1958. Um, just from a historic perspective, the FDA started in 1938 but it didn't cover medical devices until the uh, mid-1970s. So this d device here, and you can see it up here, um, Earl Bakken made in his garage. Um, it had a 9-volt battery. He plagiarized the circuit diagram of a metronome, so he did reverse engineering there. Um, put a little uh, buttons on there so he could get the output and the rate. And basically, they got a dog. They did an AV block on the dog. and. Um, Basically, it was Dr. Vincent Gott. Uh, he was doing his thesis work for his PhD. He was a surgeon on this. And basically, um, Earl brought it down to the lab. They hooked it up. The thing worked perfect. Um, and the next morning, Earl Bakken, at that time, Medtronic was a two-person company. They were subcontracted by the university to keep all the equipment running in the, uh, the ORs. Uh, normally he would go up to the ORs first, make sure all equipment works, but that next morning he came to the lab first to see how his battery-powered device was working. And he arrives to the lab and Dr. God is cleaning up. The dog's dead on the table. And Earl said, what happened? And he goes, well, last night Dr. Lillehy did late rounds, came to the lab to see how I was doing, so he took the device off the dog and put it up on the patient in the ICU. Uh, this was the era back then, you know, and uh, the chairman of the department back there, uh, Dr. Wangenstein, Owen Wangenstein, was the, not only he was the FDA, but he was also the IRB. There were no IRBs at this period of time either. So he just gave him approval to do it. So it's kind of interesting to see where we've gone in the last 60 years. So. If we look at the FDA, I'm going to focus on the FDA because I'm more familiar with that, and it, it, it applies to other regulatory institutions, but it's really, there's a whole branch of the United States Executive Department really promoting public health uh, through these regulations. And the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, intends uh, also to open up a Middle East office, if they haven't already, uh, which will actually be located in Israel. So by their definition, a medical device is an instrument, apparatus, implement, machine, contrivance, implant, in vitro or reagent, or other similar related article including a component or part which, uh, or accessory which is um, recognized by the official national formulary of the United States Pharmacopedia or any other supplement to that, intended for the use in the diagnosis of disease or other conditions, or in a cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease in man or other animals. Or, it gets you know, pretty complicated as you go through this de definition, but really intended to affect structure or any function of the body of man or other animals, and which does not achieve any of its primary intended purposes through chemical action within the body or man or other animals, and of which is not dependent upon being metabolized for the achievement of any uh, primary intended purpose. So this was the original one. Now you can see that we're getting more complicated because we have these combination therapies. 
Um, we're, at, we're having the target delivered of agents. We have drug eluding stents. We have other uh, means where you're going to actually modify this where a medical device may um, relate to pharmacology. And so there's a new area that's looking at that as well. But a medical device can range anywhere from the ones that you uh, define as unsafe this morning. Um, and some of them sounded really unsafe. Uh, but from a simple thing, from a tongue depressor to a bedpan, all the way to very complex, like a programmable pacemaker or microchip technology or, or laser surgery devices. And as we see more and more, you know, these are getting even more complicated where there's indi uh, individuals have developed holograms um, of the heart that you're looking at as you're doing the intervention. This will be the future. You'll have the hologram of the heart rotating in front of you um, as you're doing it, but that is a medical device, projecting that image in real time, and it has to be correct and accurate. Um, in vitro diagnostic products, you know, they can be lab re equipment, reagents, um, it can be monoclonal antibodies and all these, oh, whoops, uh, DNA on a chip, uh, something happened here, there we go. Um, and then you can look at electronic things, and it can be very complicated all the way to x-rays and medical lasers. Um, when we look at this. So uh, the medical device classes are established um, and you can look at these three classes. There's actually 1700 different generic types of devices um, which are grouped into these 16 different medical panels and then they're uh, based into one of these three um, regulatory classes. And you know, there's class one which are the general con controls Class two or general controls, my pad, uh, maybe I'm timed here, and uh, specific controls, and then controls, um, general controls and pre-mark approval is really uh, relegated to these class three devices. So these are the panels. Um, today we're more focusing on cardiovascular, even though I, I heard in the audience we have a broad range of uh, clinicians and medical device developers, which is great, because um, you, uh, your network um, uh, solution that works in one area of medicine could be applied to another and you can't forget that. Don't always stay in your groups of, uh, you know, maybe cardiovascular people, expand it to, to others because they might have good solutions as well. Um, so if you look at these classes and controls, in addition to the general controls, the class two and class three devices are subject to further uh, requirements special, such as special controls and pre-market approval. So what are these? Well, the class two devices, by definition, um, you are any device with reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness can be obtained by applying special controls. And um, these special controls may include something as special labeling uh, requirements, mandatory performance standards, uh, developing a patient registry to track how well that device or uh, technology has worked, and or post-market surveillance. If we look at class three, this is much more stringent now. This is what we have already heard some insight into this uh, from our last talk, where you've done the animal study, studies or the preclinical research and then you're going to go to the human uh, clinical trials. And so this is all required uh, before we get the pre-market approval. Um, and this is really the FDA is, uh, in the United States is taking all that data, taking all these results, and evaluating it. And in the U.S., it's really looking at safety and uh, effectiveness. In Europe, it was in the past just looking at safety, but it sounds like now they're going to go follow more the U.S. and we'll have both safety and efficacy um, uh, insight into a given device. Class three devices, in general, you can kind of think of it this way, are usually support to sustain a human life. So they're substantial in importance preventing impairment of the human health, or uh, which presents a potential or reasonable risk of illness or injury. So. Um, there's unique identification uh, that's required by the FDA. Um, you can kind of look on these standards. I'm not going to read through all this, but all this stuff is on their website. They actually have a really great website where if you have a question, actually can, you can write it in and you'll get an uh, electronic response back. 
Um, and it's really important to build relationships uh, with your regulatory boards, whether it's uh, for CE, Mark, or the FDA, or other uh, boards. Um, it's really uh, getting to know them, building a relationship, and uh, uh, your network with them. Again, now let's take a step back to where we started at the beginning uh, of today. We talked about this development process in 2011. So you're, you're meeting with a, a physician or it might be a, another group of engineers and you know you, this might be on a cocktail napkin, now it might be on an iPhone or an iPad. Uh, people are really getting uh, using this technology. But then the next thing is you'll go to this fancy animation and visualization, some of which we saw today. Then you'll develop your prototype and like uh, Professor Durfee noted, you know, develop simple prototypes fast, the quick and dirty, refine them and keep working on them. Once you have something that you think will actually um, be functional, so you have a functional prototype, then you'll do some bench testing, look at the ins and outs of that, and then you really want to do your design freeze at some point. And once you have your design freeze, then you would go into this animal testing. Um, maybe it wouldn't require 300 animals, but still, as we heard, that these can be uh, very expensive uh, steps that you'll have to do. And then you'll uh, redesign this, and then you'll eventually do your clinical testing, and then hopefully get your market release. So this is our animation now. I showed you the one earlier. Now we're making a little even more fancy uh, than we had originally. So we're kind of going through the whole procedure. And these are not only used for presenting your ideas for uh, venture capitalists or others, investors, but it also can be used for uh, presenting to your voice customer, your physicians. Um, you know, this is our concept. This is how this is going to work. What do you think about this? Is this something we should do? Is this approach necessary? And you're trying to use those animations to get that kind of feedback. So here we're just... Um, extending and retracting our helix on our, our lead. Um, we're kind of showing all the steps that this would involve. Um, and a lot of the feedback we got on this device was that we didn't like the step where you had to pull a stylet in and out. So we made this uh, handle or rotatable mechanism where you could actually have a slit and put it right over the, the wire itself. Um, and that's the only way we got that is through the voice of customer really showing them how it would be work from one end to the other and understanding that well. All right, so I'll move on from there. Hopefully this will play. So now we're looking at these fancy visualizations and I have to toot my own horn a little bit. I, I'm at the university. I run what's called Visible Heart Lab. I don't know if this is playing. And what we'll do is we reanimate human hearts. And we do this all with a clear perfusate, and then we can put a device inside and then lo really look at the device tissue interface in a very careful way. So this is a human heart that's been reanimated with a clear perfusate. It's got cardiac outputs of three to five liters per minute. Um, and this is a core valve that's being placed in it, which Dr. Latan showed you before. Uh, this is actually a, a video publication that's out in the uh, uh, JAC, Journal of American College of Cardiology, in the last month. Um, so you can go online and, and uh, get this as well. But the whole thing is now we're looking at a visualization in human anatomy. So my lab has the fortunate ability to do reanimated swine hearts, dog hearts, other large mammalian. And then we'll develop our method, look at the device tissue interface, and then eventually, when available, we'll uh, do such a device in a, a reanimated human heart um, in this varied anatomy. And we can do multimodal imaging. Uh, so you can have echo and you can have plural. You can have a ca camera um, above and below. Uh, you can see the different views there. So <clears throat> on the uh, upper uh, corner, uh, upper trace, you have the camera is in the left ventricle looking uh, from below. Um, you're looking at that self-expanding uh, stent of the core valve. And the upper uh, right is the up in the ascending aorta. We have a camera. And then the lower right is the fluoro and the lower left is the echo. And uh, we can deploy the device and watch this whole uh, uh, device tissue interface. 
So on this website, if you go onto the card here, uh, we have several thousand um, images and movies of hearts. It's all free access and all downloadable. Um, and we basically developed this as a resource to better understand cardiac anatomy. We've, like I said, we've reanimated over 50 human hearts. Some of these are normal, but most have pathologic uh, states in them. And the whole goal is to really um, allow this to get out for medical device designers in the cardiac area, uh, to make it fully accessible. Um, and these are, hearts are gifted to us from organ donors and their families. So therefore we've gifted back all this um, to everybody in, in both uh, like our first year medical students to get the website and all of their cardiac module they're using this to supplement their, their learning. All right, so GMP stands for Good Manufacturing Practice. The FDA um, continues to revise this, so you got to read online, stay up to date. Uh, FDA approval is needed for most biomedical devices. Um, they really utilize the standards established by the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO, um, and you can look at the different ISO standards as well. Um, so you can uh, look on the, uh, online at the uh, ISO uh, website, and they'll look at the different families of regulatory uh, issues relative to that, <coughs> ISO 9000 or 1400, or 14000, excuse me. And uh, 9000 is really looking at uh, quality management, and ISO uh, 14000 is really looking at environmental management. So these are the issues you can't just develop the device and you know, de uh, uh, impact the environment in, in any way with all your packaging. That uh, packaging either has to be recycled or uh, everything else. And this is all regulated uh, to a high degree. So um, if you're looking at your uh, design controls for manufacturing, uh, typically the approach is to look at uh, the perspective of European sales. Um, and the reason you do that is because the design controls uh, requirements of the ISO 9001 is really the most com comprehensive standard that includes requirements as, as Professor Griffey showed us all the way from design development to production to installation and servicing the, the product. So uh, GMP it's really ensures quality uh, through each of those steps. Um, so you'll kind of uh, look at that uh, from manufacturing um, all the way to uh, storage. So this is just a list of things that are included in GMP. Um, so you're looking at organization and the personnel, the design practices, the building environment, uh, design labeling, um, control components, packaging and labeling, device holding, how long can you hold the device, where should it be held, you know, it's evaluation, uh, manufacturing records, um, and your whole compliant uh, process and audits. So it's a very complicated thing that if you're going to be an entrepreneur um, starting your own company where you're going to actually do the manufacturing in it, uh, these are things you need to consider up front. So, the regulatory boards are really looking for your evidence to support your claims, that the technology is safe and effective, um, and also uh, that the claim is that the technology is uh, cost effective. You can develop something, but if no one can afford it or it's uh, ridiculously you know, more expensive than current technologies, um, this is also something that won't move forward for you. If we look at the requirements, uh, there's really multiple ways of doing this. The easiest is a, you know, a 510K um, pre-market approval. Uh, if you have a predicate device, um, maybe even if it's a, a class three, you might be able to, um, be able to use pre-market approval uh, notification or a 510K. Um, it's really to demonstrate that the, the device uh, to be marketed is substantially equivalent to something else. Uh, currently in the U.S. market. So, um, the U in the U.S., the FDA requires that the ma uh, manufacturers not place their devices into the U.S. commerce uh, until they receive uh, mark clearance uh, from the FDA. Um, there are these exceptions. There's the humanitarian device exemptions, HCEs. Um, you can kind of look at all, all this um, as well. 
this is often where um, you'll get some of the first knowledge on a clinical device um, if you're uh, looking at your device for uh, humanitarian uh, device exemptions. Uh, there's AVIMED code, as I mentioned before, something to be familiar with. Every state um, is different. It was interesting that I went to the uh, American Heart Association meeting um, in uh, Chicago and, and a year ago, and they had a little uh, uh, plaque uh, by the espresso makers. So a lot of the companies were giving out free espresso. And there was a little note that um, you weren't allowed to do this if you were a health care provider from Minnesota. Because uh, Minnesota had a different uh, exemption standard for Avamed than others. And so um, it was kind of interesting. All the Minnesotans were at Starbucks, I guess, and everybody else was getting free coffee at the, in, at the booths. So uh, need for bench testing, uh, really to optimize your product design. Once you've got a working prototype, uh, you really like, you want to simulate various clinical anatomies. You want to look at accelerated wear testing. You want, again, ongoing verification of the utility of the technology. And you really want to do all this in a freeze of design before you go into the preclinical studies. The need for preclinical studies is really, develop, again, to validate the efficacy of a device within an appropriate animal model. And we heard that can vary. If you want to have collateralization, you take the dog. If you don't want collateralization, you might take a swine. Um, and then you can even modify you know, the model to uh, induce a different disease state. I'm sure Dr. Granada will go into that. But you can do high rate pacing to induce heart failure in a swine model, for example. Um, and then you uh, really looking at your safety data uh, for this, for your 510 uh, submissions or for developing your clinical trials. You want to look at biocompatibility and you want to gain uh, confidence in the technology itself. Clinical research, you really want to optimize again product design, but you really have done this you're doing this ongoing verification and you really want to uh, improve your process efficiency. So, you know, why are you performing this clinical research? You know, well, you're in, if you um, can do it from an academic standpoint, you're really looking at to test the elements of clinical practice. You're justifying clinical decisions and the uh, outcome economic factors, and it's really the intellectual pursuit of truth or the understanding of a clinical event. Problem with clinical research, it's uh, empirical, it's critical, uh, it must be observable, documented, and examined critically, but um, really preclinical and clinical research cannot be reduced to a finite <coughs> science. It's very different than the standard engineering uh, disciplines where if you're a mechanical engineer or uh, you know, a structural engineer or, or electrical engineer, you can do a design experiment and it's really finite. It's very re reproducible over time. Where um, preclinical and clinical research, uh, there's no real pure scientific method often. We heard the, the last talk was great. Um, you know, they didn't do the uh, common carotid artery, they did, went down to ephemeral uh, type of design. Um, so it's, it really has to take some intuition and creativity. And um, this is where you really need to t talk to the experts that have done this over and over and over and get some insight into the design. And um, this is uh, my lab. We do animal research uh, uh, all, all week long, several studies a week um, on large animal uh, models. And I'm often approached uh, to get insights from others into the models. Uh, if we look at regulatory issues, this is something just to note because we're going to have you design an animal study in the future. Typically for valve designs now, they su the, uh, uh, it's suggested from ISO, uh, basically you do 10 to 15 animals, uh, 2 to uh, 4 controls in each position, and have longevity studies. Good laboratory practice, something also to consider when you're doing this, all preclinical studies. Um, need to be assessed under G, good laboratory practice uh, conditions, and you need an independent auditor to do such. 
That means you're documenting all your procedures. So kind of to sum up now as we go, um, if we look at the common research and development flow pattern, you know, you do a lot of work in vitro. Uh, you've developed your prototypes, you do your bench testing, you're looking at your durability, your hemodynamics li limits, you'll then bring that down to animal studies. If it doesn't work out in the animal trial, you go back upwards to your in vitro testing, redevelop your prototype, and you go back and forth there in this yellow arrow as long as you think you need to before you go down to your human clinical trials. You know, your costs are getting more and more expensive as you go down this chart. So your bench top testing is your least expensive, then uh, very expensive, still animal, but clinicals are um, exceedingly exponentially even higher. So lastly, um, we're in Minneapolis. We're having the Design of Medical Device Con Conference in April. We also gave you brochures. Um, it's our 11th annual meeting. Um, and this is the designing of medical devices in all areas uh, of medicine, and we welcome and invite you all to attend as, as well. So uh, we'll move on, and uh, we'll save our questions for the panel.